Welcome. And good afternoon from Santa Fe, from the campus of St. John's College. Uh, I thank you all for joining us. For those of you who might not know me, I'm Walter Sterling, the Dean of St. John's College in Santa Fe. Uh, and I'm happy to be here to share my opening lecture of the year and generally to welcome you to the Dean's Lecture and Concert Series. While we are all sorry to be physically distant from one another, we continue to be happy to welcome a wider group of members of our community, students, staff, faculty, and alumni from both of our campuses to these online events and to the Dean's Lecture and Concert Series this year. If we have any technical difficulties, we will try to address them. Uh, give us a few minutes, but if it takes more than a few minutes, we will go ahead and end today's event and either reschedule or share a recording. Hasn't happened yet, but it's gonna happen one of these days. We have several events upcoming, uh, especially as we continue to use this platform to experiment with different formats. Uh, I wanna thank again, Mr. Ferdy, Ferdy and the student panel who started our series last week very successfully. This coming Wednesday, we have a faculty and staff panel uh, that will be speaking on a Supreme Court opinion for Constitution Day, which is next Thursday. Uh, the panel is on Wednesday afternoon at 4.30. Then next Friday at 4.30, uh, tutor Peter Pesic will be offering a concert and talk uh, under the title Music as Science and Expression. Uh, I believe that will happen at 4.30 next Friday, the 18th. And then on Friday the 25th, uh, we're going to have a tutor panel, Mr. Carl, Mr. McDonald, and Mr. Venkatesh speaking on photography. So please join us for those upcoming events. I want to thank a few folks Above all and always, my teacher, Anne Hartle, who elevated Montaigne's significance for me and for many readers of her books here in Santa Fe by lecturing last year. Also a group of seminar participants who've joined a series of seminar discussions with me on Montaigne through, uh, through the Agora Foundation. This group happens to include some alumni of the college and they've made my summer reading of Montaigne much richer than it would have been otherwise. I also want to thank my colleague, uh, Eric Popoli, and a gr group who joined him in a faculty study group in the summer of 2012. Mr. Popoli organized a very fine set of readings and discussions on the origin of what for a long time was called the new program at St. John's, our program of instruction, the St. John's program as it is recognizable today. 2012 was the 75th anniversary of the introduction of the new program in Annapolis kind of refounding of St. John's College. And I've gone back to that set of readings over the years and did so again recently. It seems to me this year, much more than most, we are challenged to recover consciously the deep sources and rationales for choosing this form of education, or frankly, for choosing any form of education. Less can be taken for granted. That is true here. It is true for my children in elementary and middle school. In that and other ways, we are challenged to understand our own history as an institution and community better than ever before, perhaps. I would encourage our student committee on instruction or any other student or faculty group to consider hosting some meetings on those readings that Mr. Popoli compiled, all of which are organized with supporting notes and archived in the library and the Dean's office. And for similar reasons, I'd like to thank our librarians, Jennifer Sprague, Craig Jolly, and Laura Cooley. Uh, they do a great deal of work to uh, preserve, organize, and build up uh, our archives uh, and our oral and written history of the college. And uh, I'm often and recently have been asking them for resources. And they're, um, uh, they, they do tremendous work. Um, uh, for us, much of it, much of it invisible and uh, slow metabolizing work. It seems to me a difficult and somber day today. I want to acknowledge those who are memorializing loved ones 
lost in the 9-11 attacks and doing so under circumstances altered, circumstances other than those they, they might have chosen. I also want to recognize the great difficulties and loss of life from the wildfires raging in the West. Our own college community is scattered across the country, across the world. And I know we have many folks directly and indirectly impacted by these fires. Like the other challenges we face, we'll pull through these together and better, I hope, for remaining connected across the distance as Johnny's. So I'm about, about to begin the talk proper. Uh, I've been asking people to try to go a little shorter in this format and I'm going to fail utterly. I think I'm going to be speaking for right about an hour. Uh, I uh, do have some, some quotes, a few slides, so I might shift into screen sharing when I get to those, if, there, if time is pressed, I might uh, skip some of them. Um, after the talk, we'll take just a minute or two break and then have a question period. Uh, for freshmen, it's a great tradition at the college to say that the lectures are for the sake of the question period. And we intentionally call it a question period and not a question and answer period. Uh, and uh, uh, we will do the best we can to have conversation together for any who uh, want to, to, to stay on and do so. Uh, I, I do think in this format, it's not all we'd like it to be. And we look forward to the time when we'll be back sitting around the room uh, for the kind of spontaneity that that allows. Um, but when we get to the question period, I'll talk about how you can share questions or comments uh, through chat or through the Q&A or by raising your hand and asking a live voice question. Um, with that, I will begin. This year's pandemic has brought the greatest challenge and greatest disruption to higher education, to education at all levels, certainly in my lifetime. My view, a common one I think, is that we must look back to World War II for anything comparably sudden and far reaching in its immediate effects on our schools and colleges and universities, to say nothing of every other aspect of our life. As far as St. John's goes, I want to repeat what I've said in many ways since March 13th, give or take. Despite the ongoing challenges and despite the fact that many of us are dealing with enormous difficulties caused by the pandemic, difficulties that go well beyond the classroom and academic life, I have never been more proud to be a Johnny. I've never been more proud of our college community and its spirit of our ability to pull together, to persevere, to adapt. I've seen it daily, literally daily, from the day our students left campus for spring break and for good around March 13th through the first seminars of this academic year on August 27th and now two full weeks into the semester. This spirit has been manifest among our students, staff and faculty and their families, among the officer and board leadership of the college, among our extended alumni community. It has taken the shape of small gestures of kindness, of marathon planning efforts, of generous giving to the college, of challenging but goodwill debates and deliberations. But above all, it has taken shape in the will and fortitude to persevere and continue to find meaning, the deepest sources of meaning, in the daily work of reading, study, and conversation that are the primary activities of our small college community. This spirit, which our presidents here in Annapolis have eloquently celebrated in recent letters and talks, has been and will be so important. The words we reach for, resilience and adaptability, the ability to learn from challenges, esprit de corps and camaraderie, the pursuit of virtue even, may seem overused, but we mean them. This spirit is, to borrow a phrase from an older writing of my distinguished colleague and former Dean, Eva Brand, in a piece addressing other challenges, this spirit is, quote, one condition for weathering the fierce trials to which the world is about to subject this tough and fragile little school. I've long loved that final description of our college, the tough and fragile little school. The spirit you have shown 
and the conviction that the quiet patient activities of becoming thoughtful and free, of becoming better, braver, and less helpless, if we believe we should inquire into that which we do not know, as Socrates says in the Mino. Those are what will allow us to endure and endure well this challenge. If we continue as we have, the disruption of the pandemic, as well as the challenges of the tremendous ferment and upheaval of our national politics, will only, or ultimately, strengthen our community and our college, and deepen our sense that this education matters more, not less, during times such as these. It is in reflecting on this moment in which we find ourselves and the trials it poses to our education, to liberal education, and to a college community such as ours, that I wanted to spend some brief time meditating on the conditions and purposes of our founding as the college that we are, and on Montaigne's ideas of the ends of education. For in considering the founding of the St. John's program as we know it, I would go so far as to say that crisis is the natural environment and ever renewing source of liberal education. One might say something similar about Montaigne's extraordinary effort to pursue and model human freedom, in large part as a response to the tremendous political upheavals and civil or religious wars, which spanned much of his life and all of his literary endeavors as well as to the outbreaks of the bubonic plague and to other more personal trials to which he was subjected. I'm not a historian of the college, but I wanna highlight some features of our founding or an interpretation of our founding that are not esoteric, but are perhaps not fully appreciated. The St. John's program emerged, was founded in 1937 as a response to crisis in several senses. There was the immediate crisis of one of the oldest colleges in the country having drifted to and passed the brink to the sad outcome of bankruptcy and loss of accreditation. This crisis enabled a small group of educational philosophers and visionaries, Scott Buchanan and String Fellowbar, chief among them in the St. John's context, to be handed the keys to the college, so to speak, a blank slate to be given near free reign to institute a wholly new curriculum and program as a new lease on life for the imperiled college. But there are three more significant forms of crisis that surrounded that founding or refounding. There was what some perceived as an educational crisis, and this could be looked at from various angles. The loss or erosion of the ideal of the liberal arts and liberal education as the standard for higher education. Its replacement, associated with Charles Eliot at Harvard, by the elective system, by a closer approximation to the European Research University, or by the vocationalization and specialization of higher education. All of those being aspect, aspects of one eventually national movement. But more broadly, many educational leaders, including Eliot, wrestled with the question of how the emergence of a new society, American, perhaps broadly Western, if not yet global, an emerging post-industrial, pluralistic, democratic, mass society of workers, and in the United States, an increasingly powerful, populous, prosperous, and ethnically diverse society and nation, might require new educational forms for future generations of citizen workers, you might say, in new forms of social, political, economic, and technological relationships. What sorts of citizens and stewards of liberal, liberal democracy would the country raise up? How would surging numbers of new immigrants find their way into this nation? How might education address increasing anxiety at the dehumanizing aspects of the modern technological industrial economy and its utilization of human labor? What forms of culture would the United States produce, either as surrogates for or inheritors of the older, deeper roots of European culture? These are all questions, by the way, which have articulation, seeds, or prototypes in Tocqueville's Democracy in America as one locus among our program book 
and authors. I have a couple of quotes from the first statement of the program and from Barr, but I'm going to pass over them. Maybe we'll come back to them in the, uh, in the question period. We Americans, excuse me, that's one of those quotes I'm going to pass over. Yet another crisis, to some extent connected to those questions, and of course, much more of a true immediate and global crisis in 1937, was the looming and escalating global conflict of political ideologies and superpowers. With the rise of fascism or national socialism in Germany, the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia, and the rise of Stalin's Soviet Union, both of these political movements had as a major premise the spiritual weakness, instability, or transience of the liberal, democratic, and capitalist order of things exemplified by the United States and Western Europe, both as external threats to and meaningful internal divisions within the Western nations and in the United States in particular, these were challenges that demanded meaningful responses within higher education. Third, a crisis of meaning. Part and parcel of this geopolitical contest was the cultural crisis of the interwar period, a sense of doubt or spiritual exhaustion, a crisis of meaning associated with late modernity or late capitalism, one that was vividly reinforced by the Great Depression. In this context, I like to think of the title of a recent and valuable study of literature, The Year the World Broke in Two. That's borrowing a quote from Willa Cather, who said, the world broke into in 1922 or thereabouts. Uh, and that book traces the, the activity of Virginia Woolf, T.S. Eliot, and a couple of other modernist authors during the year in which Joyce's Ulysses was published and Proust, the English translation of Proust was published. Uh, and indeed, many felt in various ways, culturally, spiritually, that after World War I, the world had somehow broken in two. Could there be a vital American educational enterprise at the college and university level, one that resisted the trends of vocationalization, specialization, and consumerism in higher education, but one that is not an old fashioned finishing school for the elite, nor a hive for future academics. Not that there's anything wrong with educating future academics. St. John's does a lot of that. But rather one that is a widely open renewal or deepening of American citizenship and culture. One that will be able to sustain the modern liberal, democratic, and American experiment. It is with thoughts like this in mind that Walter Lippmann at the time of the founding of the new program said, I venture to believe that in the future men will point to St. John's College and say that there was the seedbed of the American Renaissance. The patent anxiety and creeping rootlessness and threats to meaning fostered by the emerging forms of modern life needed some educational antidote or antidotes. The experiment and I choose that word advisedly, understanding the founders' resistance to it, the experiment of the St. John's program, of the takeover of this small, then still conventional, but failing four-year liberal arts college, did not happen in a vacuum. The founders were in conversation with many of the most influential educational leaders of the age, and this program bore a relation to experiments and ideas in circulation at Columbia, University of Virginia, the University of Chicago, as well as in adult and continuing education experiments such as the People's Institute and similar programs. Uh, in the case of the People's Institute offering lectures, night school and seminars for adult workers and for immigrant communities in New York City at the Cooper Union, uh, among other places. These complex histories are interesting in themselves and have been told by others. My goal is simply to highlight this sense of the immediate purpose and responsiveness of this educational experiment 
carrying national, even world historical significance. Purposes closely knit to the lives we must forge in our modern forms of socioeconomic life and as citizens of mass liberal democracies. As such, it is quite the opposite of aloof study, hobbyism, or bookishness that animated these efforts. I would call it the very opposite of insularity or withdrawal from the world. And I say that again advisedly as someone myself who has defended and continues to defend the idea that we need to withdraw from the world to an extent to sufficiently deepen our education as a liberal education. Within four years of its founding, the college together with the nation and the world faced another crisis, World War II. The college had to fend off losing its campus to military necessity, but it also undertook all kinds of efforts to adapt itself to the needs of the moment. Importantly, given the draft age, it enrolled classes with students as young as 15 who hadn't finished high school in a three-year accelerated program that would allow them to graduate before potentially being drafted or serving in the military. The college introduced the study of the radio and the internal combustion engine as a practicum of sorts to prepare for whatever exigency might come. This class was subject to some doubts at the time. I'm going to uh, read a quote and I'm gonna put it up on the screen, so give me a moment. This is just a cheerful slide uh, that reminds me of us. Okay. This is from Winfrey Smith's uh, wonderful and slender history of the early years of the, the program. Quoting, the college administration took various steps to prepare the students in what they thought might be useful in war. There was a three hour course once a week in radio. There was a course in navigation. Franz Plunder, a sculptor and boat builder who also possessed many other skills, taught a group of about 60 persons the intricacies of the gasoline engine. For as the 1942 yearbook put it, no one knew which St. Johnny might be stranded in a tank somewhere on the battlefront where there would be no hardware store and mechanics for him to turn to. The press poked a certain amount of fun at the Great Books College for this course in the gasoline engine. Actually, the course was in line with Buchanan's view that there is a training of the intellect that happens in the learning and practice of the manual arts, as well as the liberal arts. Also, Buchanan knew that one learns quite a bit of physics if one acquires a full understanding of all the transformations of energy that take place in the internal combustion engine. Whether these courses were in fact useful to many of the students when later they were in military service is doubtful. So in lieu of a photograph of folks working on the engine, uh, but in a somewhat playful and serious spirit, here is uh, a shot of uh, search and rescue here in Santa Fe, I think around 1971, courtesy of our librarians perhaps uh, a little less on point, some horseback riding out here uh, on the edges of our campus. And uh, then maybe simply for, for levity, uh, some cows on our campus. And I share those slides, again, not simply playfully, but in the spirit of the comments that, that I'm about to make here. To my way of looking at the college, humor aside, it is a welcome and jarring exemplar, that is that description of the classes that were, uh, uh, that, that were engineered during World War II. It is a welcome and jarring exemplar of the Odyssean resourcefulness that is as close as anything can be to the taproot of this college's ideal of liberal education. Understanding 
there are rivals, rivals in the traditional understanding of the liberal arts and their expression over time. And for example, in the primacy that we might give to Plato and Socrates in our thinking at St. John's. The freshmen just had their first seminar on the Odyssey, the opening lines of which will or should feel as inexhaustibly rich, perhaps richer or 40 or 50 years from now, as they might on a first reading. Tell me muse of the man of many devices, driven far astray after he had sacked the sacred citadel of Troy. Many were the men whose cities he saw and whose minds he learned, and many the woes he suffered in his heart upon the sea seeking to win his own life and the return of his comrades. The man of many devices, Polutropos, the many turned man who saw the cities and learned the minds of many men. This is one image of the original versatility and self-possession, freedom and exploration intended by the founders of our program. Many turned, polytropic, intellectually restless and omnivorous, practical and prudent, democratic and populist, civic-minded and engaged, better able to converse with fellow citizens, colleagues and coworkers of all sorts, conditions and classes, better able to take up the practical study of the internal combustion engine or anything else necessary, and, and deeply reflective, self-critical, capable of highly abstract reasoning about ultimate things, aesthetically sensitive and articulate about beauty, capable of finding the highest pleasures in reading and studying books and other works of art on their own terms and for the sake of those activities themselves. The possibility of such educational ends and ambitions did not seem to them a luxury or a matter of interest only to the few to the gold souls, we might say, using a platonic image. They thought that the future of civilization, something we late moderns ought never to take for granted, and a healthy political order, depended on radicalizing or deepening and democratizing the pursuit of such wildly ambitious or seemingly eccentric ends. We today, are more aware than ever of how limited this democratizing was at the time by race, by gender, by nationality, and to some degree by class. There is much more to be said about the books themselves, the idea and scope of the liberal arts, the role of music and natural science in our curriculum, the many evolutions of the program over the last 83 years, the way it has been extended to wider circles and the ways its impact and reach have fallen short of our original and ongoing intentions and ambitions. There's much more to be said about the contrarianism that is restated both by and about our college since its inception, sometimes as praise, sometimes as critique. The current moment, however, has distilled for me and for some others in our community, a sense that the perception of the college and our program as a kind of fixed star stable in content, embodied in a list of books, proudly detached from the world or the present, proudly apolitical, proudly sheltering time and space for reflection away from the pressures of the moment, proudly impractical and unfashionable, contrarian, bookish and intellectual, and appealing perhaps to the few or the quirky. For all the truth, in those perceptions. The partial and typically over amplified truth of this set of perceptions, this face of the college, risks eclipsing the underlying and ever renewing urgency and imminent practicality of what we do and why we exist. By way of balancing that distortion, I invite us to see in the whole modern history of the college and the program, and especially in our founding, the cultivation of Odyssean adequacy to whatever comes, and to see that we are energized, not repelled, by the great challenges that emerge inevitably for each generation. Our most current societal and technological disruption caused by the pandemic 
and the ongoing hyperpartisan and polarized forms of our contemporary national politics and the current national movement for racial justice and equality, to name a few of the things that this generation faces. I would not have our college community believe that St. John's is or should be most distant from or least prepared to address such challenges. Quite the opposite. It is precisely for such things that you are or should be prepared and equipped. It is perhaps not immediately clear how a quiet, even languid class spent demonstrating propositions from Euclid's elements prepares one for such challenges, but behold, it does or can if taken up with the right spirit and purpose and seen through to its end. Now to Montaigne, but I will continue to say the over anglicized Montaigne. Montaigne had lived a relatively full life, one most of us would recognize as infused by the spirit and practice of liberal education before he retired to his library in 1571 on his 38th birthday and decided to undertake the great work of a new and foundational project, a personal or existential project of a sort, but also a literary, philosophical, and political project. Embodied in the activity of writing and in the finished product, the book of his essays. His work gave that word, whose primary meaning is attempt, its new and universal meaning as a literary form. And that is just one of the many ways he can be seen as directly influencing or as presaging various developments of modern thought and life. A humanist par excellence, most but not all would say secular humanist par excellence, he offered an early and riveting argument or example for individual freedom, especially freedom of intellect and conscience perhaps, and for waves of challenges to political, religious, or intellectual orthodoxies of his day. His rhetorical emphasis on the body and on the proximity or relative similarity between humans and, and other animals, his challenge to the simple superiority of advanced European or Christian civilization to other peoples, nations, and civilizations, his preoccupation with the particularities of his own tastes and foibles, his own diet, health, and body, his sexuality, his vast surveying of the landscape of the recently recovered or popularized classics, together with Christian authors and texts, his extensive representation or renewal of classical skepticism, if only as a tool or foil against exaggerated certainties or totalizing systems of thought, his use of the essay and essays as an explicit form of self-creation and self-authorship, one that has resonated with great writers and essayists from Bacon to Nietzsche and Emerson, one that makes him somehow personally present in a novel way, and that has set a standard for such authorial presence in a work. All this made him widely read, if not widely or immediately approved, in his own day, and had direct and profound influence on Descartes and Pascal, Bacon and Hobbes, Shakespeare, it seems, and many others. We currently read three of his essays in the sophomore seminar in the spring of the education of children, of cannibals, and of experience. Three of the 107 that compose the final edition of the essays, three that happen to exclude by far the longest and most directly relevant to philosophical and theological systems and skepticism in particular, the apology for Raymond Sebon. I'm going to speak to a narrow, if significant, strand of his thought, his celebration of independent judgment and freedom, which runs throughout the essays in the context of his re reflections on education. Montaigne entered the itinerary, the itinerary of my thinking this year, as he did for some others, 
in part as a response to the pandemic and to physical isolation, both of which are themes of his writing and life, directly and indirectly. But more deeply, I have a growing sense that the full range of the pressures on us of our current times beyond the pandemic highlight for us the challenge in freeing one's mind, especially in the sense that Montaigne intends when he speaks of belonging to oneself or of cultivating one's own judgment or good judgment. To my eye, these pressures that seem to impinge more strongly than ever on us are bound up with the much commented on synergies between current technologies and the habits of attention and channels of communication that they are designed to form on the one hand and our polarized political culture on the other hand. That synergy fuels and is fueled in turn by an increase in anxiety and depression, which further constrains or deflects our paths to the kind of self-possession and independence of mind and judgment which equip us for reasoned and effective citizenship. What the current statement of the program calls the means, quoting the means and the will to become free and responsible citizens, or what our mission statement calls the ability to make thoughtful choices in public and private life. More generally, these conditions challenge all of us in our ability to maintain a kind of equanimity and humane joy in the commerce of society, what should be one of the highest aims and justifications of our form of social and political life. Montaigne's advocacy for and exercises essays toward freedom of mind and judgment and towards equanimity and joy seem among the more salient and salutary available to us. While he did not face and was not responding to our exact set of challenges, those he did face may appear homologous or analogous to ours. More generally, the value he sets in self-possession and freedom and the exertions and remedies he undertakes seem to shine in our contemporary context. That said, there is no serious consideration of such fundamental values, which is uncontroversial. To accept Montaigne's presentation of freedom, I won't call it a system or doctrine, perhaps we can call it a philosophy of life, is implicitly and explicitly to reject serious alternatives. I will touch on this at the end. But I will also join Montaigne and a style of his own thinking in arguing that we might benefit from some aspects of his philosophy, may even find them essential, even while doubting or rejecting the more comprehensive view of which they are an aspect or component. The essay on the education of children is one of the most widely read essays, and it's one of the longer ones, relatively speaking. It has a charming personal touch, both in his narration of his own upbringing and in being addressed to a particular acquaintance. It's presented as a follow-up request uh, from, from a reader of the prior, primarily critical essay on pedantry or school, uh, schoolmaster learning, uh, du pedantisme. It has seemed to many prescient of some later developments or movements in child psychology or educational philosophy. It also has several highly illustrative capsule formulations of what he sees as the proper value of philosophy specifically for life, to use a kind of Nietzschean formulation. The answer, great value, but it's typically misused or misunderstood. The prior essay is crit critical du pedantisme, pedantry, is critical of the educational tendencies of Montaigne's time and place, which he attacks in various ways as misinterpreting education as, to oversimplify, a parroting of the learning of others. While there are positive alternatives suggested, that essay, like most, is dialectical in that sense, and to an extent, it remains largely satirical and critical. One typical passage, let me see if I have this in, in the slide, and if so, I'll put it up. No, 
I don't think I do. One typical passage. We take the opinions and the knowledge of others into our keeping, and that is all. We must make them our own. We are just like a man who, needing fire, should go and fetch some at his neighbor's house, and having found a fine big fire there, should stop there and warm himself, forgetting to carry any back home. What good does it do us to have our belly full of meat if it is not digested, if it is not transformed into us, if it does not make us bigger and stronger? Do we think that Lucullus, whom books without experience made and fashioned into such a great captain, used them in our manner? We let ourselves lean so heavily on the arms of others that we annihilate our own powers. Even if we could be learned with other men's learning, at least wise we cannot be except by our own wisdom. And throughout, I'm using the frame translation. This essay then serves as prelude for the highly constructive and positive essay on the education of children, which to repeat is presented as a response uh, and it's presented as a guide and addressed to an acquaintance, a noble woman who is expecting a child. Montaigne begins the essay with an apparently ironic but typically self-critical or self-examining set of disclaimers about his own ability to judge the learning of others, given the weakness of his faculties in education, quoting. And so I myself see better than anyone else that these are nothing but reveries of a man who has tasted only the outer crust of sciences in his childhood and has retained only a vague general picture of them a little of everything and nothing thoroughly, French style, end quote. Quoting again, I have not had regular dealings with any solid book except Plutarch and Seneca, from whom I draw like the Danaids incessantly filling up and pouring out. Some of this sticks to this paper, to myself, little or nothing. He then shifts into an extended discussion of what we might call an ideal what we might call an ideal if, if eminently practical education that is best for some or all prospective students, at least under his contemporary or proximate circumstances. As he introduces it, quoting, I want to tell you a single fancy of mine on this subject, which is contrary to common usage. It is all that I can contribute to your service in this matter, end quote. He concludes the essay with a narrative on his own education, which was peculiar and stemmed from his father's intentional decisions to approach his education a certain way. There are various striking features to Montaigne's educational program and principles, not the least of which is a sustained praise of philosophy and an exhortation that it become more central and primary in education, but explicitly under a revised or corrected interpretation of philosophy as primarily practical and almost coextensive with the cultivation of good judgment in human affairs, as opposed to all forms of subtle or, or abstruse reasoning. Like so much of his writing, a kind of coherent worldview and philosophy of education and life emerges through the propulsive momentum of his narration, style, and rhetoric but one that is at least dialectically in some tension with itself and one that is not at pains to resolve questions or dilemmas through extended analysis or argumentation. The essay moves on as they all do with many questions or tensions unresolved. I would highlight in turn six aspects of the essay ending with the main topic I wish to consider. Number one, the paradox of educating for freedom and independence. Montaigne introduces the theme of the essay this way, quote, in truth, I understand nothing about it except this, that the greatest and most important difficulty in human knowledge seems to lie in the branch of knowledge which deals with the upbringing and education of children. Right? The greatest and most important difficulty in human knowledge. Why is this the greatest difficulty? He does not make this perfectly clear. There are, I think, two perhaps related suggestions. The immediate sequel suggests that the difficulty is that the nature of children, their natural inclinations are both variable and obscure. And it is hard therefore to know how to cultivate each individual and or their natures may subvert our efforts to lead them certain ways. His simple concluding advice on this point 
guide them always to the best and most profitable things, quoting that phrase. That is, do not assume prematurely that you can discern their various natures or temperament and vary your education accordingly. Don't uh, assume you can do that. But when he begins in ensuing paragraphs, his educational program proper against common usage, as he says, he introduces another difficulty that is at least as profound. The tutor of the child should have a well-made rather than a well-filled head, he says, since Montaigne's goal is to make of the child an able rather than a learned man. It's quoting, an able rather than a learned man. This tutor, again, against common usage and in a novel way, he says, will not pour knowledge into the child, that's his image, but instead will, quote, correct this practice and write from the start, according to the capacity of the mind he has in hand, to begin putting it through its paces, making it taste things, choose them, and discern them by itself, sometimes clearing the way for him, sometimes letting him clear his own way." End quote. Montaigne always laces his essays with classical quotations, and at this point, he introduces the first one in this essay. It's from Cicero, quoting, "'The authority of those who teach is often an obstacle to those who want to learn. The authority of those who teach is often an obstacle to those who want to learn. This was, in essence, the whole teaching of the pedantry essay, but it foregrounds decisively the great paradox of liberal education from the standpoint of teachers or educational programs. How can one inculcate, cause, dictate, freedom, or independence? This seems to be the other way to hear the greatest difficulty in knowledge to which Montaigne refers at the outset. In a sense, this reflects the overarching program of the essays from the standpoint of the development or improvement of readers or students. To educate to freedom without the form or content of education becoming itself an impediment, a form of dependence. Attacking this problem and paradox directly amounts in Montaigne's presentation to undertaking education in a novel way and against custom. Number two, the role of books, authors, and authorities. This problem informs Montaigne's treatment of books and authors in the essay and throughout the essays. Montaigne makes clear that he believes a characteristic failing of the intellectual culture of his age is the authoritative role given to certain books and authors, be it the classics generally, Aristotle in particular, or scholastic theologians, or Protestant reformers and the identification of learning and intellectual achievement with parroting their ideas or subordinating one's own powers of inquiry and judgment to their authority. He attacks this throughout. However, Montaigne himself was deeply and widely read. He praises many authors, some in the highest terms, and deploys their sayings and teachings widely, if seemingly unsystematically, throughout the essays especially classical authors representing skeptic, Stoic, and Epicurean traditions, but also Plato and Aristotle, and so many others. In this essay, he repeats and distills his critique of our dependence on authority and the hollowness of such learning for our own ability to live and judge well. At the same time, he gives us important insight into how he would encourage a richer approach to reading great authors. He has an extended, seemingly digressive discussion of his admiration of Plutarch. In the context of explaining the importance of a wide experience of diverse sorts of human beings, different classes, cultures, language, languages, tastes, and habits, he analogizes to the reading about such human beings in the work of great authors. Quote, in this association with men, I mean to include, and foremost, and foremost, those who live only in the memory of books, he will associate by means of histories, that is the student, the pupil, with those great souls of the best ages, end quote. He indicates in the context of this essay a preference for history and poetry. He goes on to praise Plutarch at length and discusses the importance of Ovid in his earliest education. But the principle suggested here that rich and telling experience of the world can be gleaned perhaps best 
or paradigmatically through reading the works of great authors is an important correction to his sometimes hyperbolic and cutting critiques of the degradation of education into mere bookishness, book learning, and rote learning. The right kind of reading and right variety of authors can embody and further the development of independence, whereas the wrong kind of reading is illiberal and deepens our dependence. And in many cases, as he makes clear, our, uh, deepens our distaste for learning as onerous. Third thread, the emphasis on the body. Throughout the essays, Montaigne attends to our bodily nature and to our animal nature or similarities with animals. These themes and the way he deploys them are, among other things, explicitly intended to counteract the partiality and subvert the hierarchy of most philosophical systems. Here, Montaigne argues that education of the whole human being should involve physical education, and he cites many authors, especially Plato, in support of this. There seem to be two perhaps somewhat opposed arguments for this. Early in the essay, it is to toughen and harden the youth which seems necessary for the development or exercise of certain virtues like courage. Quote, it is not enough to toughen his soul, we must also toughen his muscles. The soul is too hard pressed unless it is seconded and has too great a task doing two jobs at once, end quote. Later, as part of the highly rhetorical praise of philosophy in a context that suggests the sweetness and delight that should accompany such education, Montaigne returns to the theme of the body. Quote, even games and exercises will be a good part of his study. Running, wrestling, music, dancing, hunting, handling horses and weapons. I want his outward behavior and social grace and physical adaptability to be fashioned at the same time with his soul. It is not a soul that is being trained, not a body, but a man, end quote. This formulation, not a soul, not a body, but a man, resonates with the earlier slogan, an able rather than a learned man. These are ways that Montaigne circumscribes or reinscribes his education to fit the human condition, the human scale, properly understood. A fourth point or thread, the importance of pleasure and affection. In this same connection, the one other time in the essay that he explicitly and crucially says he opposes custom <clears throat> regards punishment or pleasure as the effective guides to education. Quoting, for the rest, this education is to be carried on with severe gentleness, severe gentleness, not as is customary. Instead of being invited to letters, children are shown in truth nothing but horror and cruelty, away with violence and compulsion. There is nothing to my mind which so depraves and stupefies a well-born nature." End quote. Montaigne considers it at least a great error of education in his, in his age that punishment and threats are used to motivate learning, typically rote learning. One can hardly overstate how deforming he thinks this is for our relationship, not just to the acquisition of knowledge, which is not the primary purpose of education in any case, but more deeply to our ability to think and judge and live well. Montaigne, rightly or wrongly, sees pleasure as intrinsic to all versions of the good human life, and perhaps as the criterion of the good life. It is important, in any case, to be guided well by pleasure, to have our reason and judgment improve our relation to pleasure. That means disciplining it too. But education based on punishment is deeply counterproductive and cruel. As he famously says in his essay on cruelty, I cruelly hate cruelty. That whole sentence quoting, among other vices, I cruelly hate cruelty, both by nature and by judgment as the extreme of all vices, end quote. Fifth thread, his emphasis on the, on the practical as opposed to the doctrinal and a redefinition of philosophy in this, man, in this manner. The central argument of the essay is that philosophy is or should be the core of a properly liberating education. However, he is equally at pains to reframe philosophy as primarily about human things and more accessible than is thought by its advocates or its critics. 
and is a source for joy and health, not labor or gloom. I'll simply quote at length here and then fold this in to the next section. And let me put this quote up. To the examples of studying various lives may properly be fitted all the most profitable lessons of philosophy by which human actions must be measured as their rule. What it is to know and not to know and what must be the aim of study. What are valor, temperance and justice? What the difference is between ambition and avarice, servitude and submission, license and liberty. By what signs we may recognize true and solid contentment how much we should fear death, pain, and shame. For it seems to me that the first lessons in which we should steep his mind must be those that regulate his behavior and his sense, that will teach him to know himself and to die well and live well. Among the liberal arts, let us begin with the art that liberates us. They are all somewhat useful for the, edif for the edification and service of our life, just as everything else is somewhat useful let us choose the one that is directly and professedly useful for it. Now I'm skipping through a, a couple pages here. After the tutor has told his pupil what will help make him wiser and better, he will then explain to him the meaning of logic, physics, geometry, rhetoric, and the science he chooses now that his judgment is already formed, he will soon master. The soul in which philosophy <clears throat> excuse me, the soul in which philosophy dwells should by its health make even the body healthy. It should make its tranquility and gladness shine out from within, should form from its own mold the outward demeanor and consequently arm it with graceful pride an active and joyous bearing and a contented and good natured countenance. She has virtue as her goal, which is not as the schoolmen say, set on the top of a steep, rugged, and accessible mountain. Those who have approached virtue maintain, on the contrary, that she is established in a beautiful plain, fertile and flowering, from where, to be sure, she sees all things beneath her. But you can get there, if you know the way, by shady, grassy, sweetly flowering roads, pleasantly by an easy, smooth slope like that of the celestial vaults. We will let these rhetorical flourishes stand and move to our last point, six thread. <clears throat> the cultivation of good judgment and self-possession. These claims about philosophy are one ingredient of the central message of the essay. At the heart of Montaigne's educational philosophy is the cultivation of judgment, of one's own judgment. The word occurs perhaps dozens, variations on the word, dozens of times in this essay, and the theme is laced throughout the essays. While Montaigne does not ever offer a theory or system of human faculties and virtues, let's say, his repeated treatment of certain themes allows us to understand and enter his thought. The final culminating essay of experience comes closest perhaps, maybe rivaled by the book within the book that is the Apology for Zebond to presenting a kind of survey of all our faculties in relation to the key or linchpin category of experience as he develops it in that essay. In any case, in the education essay, cultivation of judgment becomes almost or perhaps simply synonymous with the end of education, with human freedom and with philosophy rightly used. He has several dramatic formulations of this, but this is perhaps the most forceful. And it's a lengthy quote again, so I'm going to share it again. <clears throat> uh, 
Let the tutor make his charge pass every, everything through a sieve and lodge nothing in his head on mere authority and trust. Let not Aristotle's principles be principles to him any more than those of the Stoics or Epicureans. Let this variety of ideas be set before him. He will choose if he can. If not, he will remain in doubt. Only the fools are certain and assured. So then offset quote of Dante's here. For doubting pleases me no less than knowing. For if he embraces Xenophon's and Plato's opinions by his own reasoning, they will no longer be theirs, they will be his. He who follows another follows nothing. He finds nothing. Indeed, he seeks nothing. We are not under a king. Let each one claim his own freedom. That last sentence is a quote from Seneca. Let him know that he knows. Let him know that he knows, at least. He must imbibe their ways of thinking, not learn their precepts. And let him boldly forget, if he wants, where he got them. But let him know how to make them his own. Truth and reason are common to everyone and no more belong to the man who first spoke them than to the man who says them later. It is no more according to Plato than according to me, since he and I understand and see it in the same way. The bees plunder the flowers here and there, but afterward they make of them honey, which is all theirs. It is no longer time or marjoram. Even so with the pieces borrowed from others, he will transform and blend them to make a work that is all his own, to wit, his judgment. His education, work, and study aim only at forming this. I borrowed my title today from a passage in the essay of Solitude, quoting, the, the greatest thing in the world is to know how to belong to oneself to know how to belong to oneself. In that immediate context, he is suggesting, seems to be suggesting a lessening of attachments to others and to the world, such that we can make use of our time by our own lights and for our own purposes. This appears to be a, com this appears to be a commentary in that essay on his own retirement to private life, to a life of reading, reflection and writing in his storied library and tower of solitude. In of, in of experience, he writes, quoting, we are great fools. He has spent his life in idleness, we say. I have done nothing today. What, have you not lived? That is not only the fundamental, but the most illustrious of your occupations. If I had been placed in a position to manage great affairs, I would have shown what I could do. That's something somebody would say. Have you been able to think out and manage your own life? You have done the greatest task of all. Our great and glorious masterpiece is to live appropriately. Have you been able to think out and manage your own life? You have done the greatest task of all. Our great and glorious masterpiece is to live appropriately." End quote. These passages all converge. How does Mon Montaigne understand us to achieve this greatest thing and accomplish this greatest task? What sort of liberation is possible? How do we come to understand what is one's own, oneself, and to be in possession of it? In a word, judgment. Montaigne develops a view of judgment as informed variously, importantly, variously, by sense, which itself judges in his terms at times, experience, reason, nature, and natural inclination. This is an open-ended process for Montaigne, one that does not meet or admit of any final perfection. And it is inherently fallible. We are fallible. In fact, cultivating a sense, awareness, and study of one's errors is itself part of the education and improvement of judgment. The forces that vex judgment and keep us from possessing ourselves vary, as we've seen, ranging from vanity and vice to tradition and authority, be it political, intellectual, or theological. What is judgment? Montaigne does not offer one definition of the faculty. Faculty is not really a Montaignean word. But his examples show the extension of the term for him. We judge that things are or are not the case. We judge how things are. We assess, characterize, or value them. Our judgments vary. 
among different people, of course, but our own judgments vary naturally, inevitably, over time. We change our minds seemingly inevitably. Judgments can be better or worse. Judgment itself can be more or less active or, or engaged and more or less our own as opposed to borrowed from others. When our own, it is never or rarely a, a matter of reason, sense, experience, or natural inclination alone. Judgments are complex and are can be informed by all or many of these at once. In a pedantry, one of his cuts at the overly learned scholar goes this way. Whoever will, quoting, whoever will closely observe this sort of people, the learned, basically, <clears throat> who are very widespread, will find, as I have, that most of the time they understand neither themselves nor others, and that they have a full enough memory, but an entirely hollow judgment." End quote. How do we avoid this hollow judgment? The remedy in the education of children is to engage the child or student or oneself as an active learner, as cliched as that now sounds, testing and judging actively from the start on suitable material, presenting and exploring through books, as well as through travel and social intercourse, the multiplicity of human characters, languages, and cultures, mores, such that the student is not forever judging by the length of his own nose. He says at one point, quote, we are all huddled and concentrated in ourselves and our vision is reduced to the length of our nose, end quote. I will paraphrase some of the many individual claims he makes about judgment just in this essay. We need to exercise both speech and judgment. We cannot simply be told how to improve these practical things or by what standards to perform them. We have to avoid selling our judgment and therefore our freedom as courtiers do, but that could apply to many areas of life. We find in discovery of our own errors and ownership of the, those errors, a peak act of judgment. We should study history, not primarily to know the facts, but to judge the characters. Wide experience of the world, du monde, as he says, he seems to mean of people and places, of mores, is a school for judgment. Quoting, so many humors, sects, S-E-C-T-S, sects, judgments, opinions, laws, and customs, teach us to judge sanely of our own, to judge sanely of our own, and teach our judgment to recognize its own imperfection and natural weakness, which is no small lesson. It is this series of reflections on improving our judgment and our acquaintance with the breadth of human experience that leads into the treatment of a practical or humane philosophy cited above as part of that itinerary. The improvement of judgment, which means among other things, making it attentively our own and seeing the obstacles to that, is the path to freedom or a kind of freedom for Montaigne, the kind of freedom that he here associates with a liberal education. Under the tutelage of Montaigne, we learn not only these exercises, but the principles that underlie them. Understanding, for example, how central judgment is to our life, its fallibility, its interconnections with sense, reason, and experience, and its characteristic obstacles and missteps. Understanding all such things with, with Montaigne also improves our ability to know how to belong to ourselves. The essay of experience perhaps reinforces this case and adds to the texture Montaigne gives to his teaching. Montaigne ends the essay with a charming and characteristic survey of his own educational path, which I won't go through here, this included his father's adoption of unconventional educational means, immersion in Latin as his first and only language until age six, a goal of gentleness in waking children that led his father to have him awoken by someone 
playing music, playing musical instrument every morning. Montaigne's aptitude and experience as an actor, among other things. The close of the essay captures his basic challenge in a rich but puzzling phrase. I'm gonna go ahead and put that up here, leave it up while I do a bit more reading. Close to the end. Quoting, to return to my subject, this is the very end of, of the essay. There is nothing like arousing appetite and affection. Otherwise, all you make out of them is asses loaded with books. By dint of whipping, they are given their pocket full of learning for safekeeping. But if learning is to do us any good, we must not merely lodge it within us. We must espouse it. Il la faut espouser espouse, maybe even marry. My seminar group spent a fruitful discussion working on what, what might be meant by espouse here. Montaigne sees in this educational program for children, for anyone, a human scaled wisdom, freedom, and bid for a pleasant and happy life insofar as that is possible. However, there is ambition and revolution and challenge in it too. To use a vocabulary that is not yet Montaigne's, we may see in Montaigne one of the first great articulations of, or bids for, a kind of radical individual autonomy, authenticity, or even self-authorship that is novel, as he seems to concede, but is also extreme in its way. He is, as he says in of experience, quote, sick for freedom. And in making himself not only the theme of his writing, but consubstantial with it, as he says, he is undertaking something extraordinary in scope, if seemingly modest in everyday practice. His vehemence is perhaps a natural response to what he perceives as the deficiencies of the educational and philosophical forms that are dominant in his day and to the excesses of the violent civil and religious wars ra raging around him. However, the remedy is not without costs or consequences. I'm gonna go ahead and stop screen sharing here for my last bit. The remedy is not without costs or consequences. Anyone who is drawn strongly toward communitarian views or certain other ideals, for example, almost all religious ideals that see love and obedience to a divine being infinitely greater than oneself as fundamental to the human good, have to be unsettled by how far reaching is Montaigne's celebration of the adventure of freely exercising one's judgment and belonging to oneself projected forward in an indefinitely reflexive or recursive way. Calls of family, tribe, city or nation, calls to love and friendship, calls to love and serve God, calls to duty as the peak experience of practical reason, as well as aspirations for philosophical insight that transcend the variability of the world and our experience. All of these rivals wither in the cheerful sunlight of Montaigne's classroom. That said, Montaigne does not intend and is not best read as presenting one philosophical system to contest the other systems on the shelves. The essays, attempts, tests, sketches, temptations even, are also exercises of sorts. In our place and time, our age and day too, we require some forms of education and therapy different than in other times and places. We face a certain set of challenges, acute, I believe, to a proper experience of self-possession, attentive wakefulness to our own opinions and judgments, to deliberate choice and action, to judgment 
and freedom to judgment being one's own. Montaigne, in responding to the crises of his age, developed a vocabulary, a set of spiritual exercises, a naturalist's guide to some of the experiences that can and must be integral to liberal education in any age, let's say. His exercises fit perhaps certain of our pressing needs. One can attend Montaigne school to one's benefit, even if in the end, we do not agree with Montaigne. An outcome that would incidentally please Montaigne. With that, I conclude. I thank you for your patience for this long talk. Uh, we'll now take just two minutes. I'm gonna put up a slide, two minutes, and then I'll come back. And uh, I hope uh, some of you will want to stay and, and continue the discussion. Okay, so there are two or three ways that you could join the, the conversation. There's a Q&A option where you can uh, uh, type a question. It may be possible for you to, um, may be possible for you to uh, put something in the chat thread to the panelist. And my preference would be if anybody wants to raise their hand and I'll unmute your microphone and then you can tell me if you'd like me to turn on your video, which I'd be happy to do um, for anybody asking a question, but you're under no obligation to do so. Um, and again, I, uh, I appreciate your indulgence and stamina with the length. Uh, um, my own uh, working hypothesis is hour long lectures with one talking head are not ideal in this platform. They may, may not be ideal in the Great Hall, uh, but, uh, but uh, I appreciate your patience. So I'm waiting for, for the first question or comment. And by the way, it occurs to me to say that 
you know, of course, in the case of freshmen uh, and others, and perhaps you have uh, freshmen and sophomores, you have not read these essays and others might be quite distant from the Montaigne. I certainly hope that you won't feel constrained in asking about any of the topics, um, uh, honestly, um, uh, based on, um, based on uh, not having read or read recently the text. Everything is, is open for discussion. So I've got a I've got a question. Can you say a little bit more about the program as practical activity? Surely it's related to contemporary life in a sense, but there's also a sense a sense in which it is properly distinct. Perhaps talk a little bit more about the relation as you uh, as you see it. Yeah, I think, I, I mean, obviously, uh, just in my own thinking, I recognize much of what I said is a kind of rhetorical overture in a certain direction meant to complement or counterbalance some other ways of, of, of talking about things. And, and I think that what's on my mind and what I said is, um, is what I sometimes perceive as, as an anxiety that if we, in the time that we're together doing what we do at the college, if we let urgent or pressing concerns, I'll just say of the day, um, uh, preoccupy us at all or Kind of enter our conversation or discourse or even just individually our thinking too much that it would somehow um, disable on the one hand the educational enterprise but on the other hand might expose a kind of lack of uh, uh, preparation or uh, equipment uh, for, for, for dealing with it almost as though we, we don't want to be tested, I guess. Now I look, I, I alluded to this. I've, I gave an earlier Dean's lecture under the title time to think, and I'm at pains to defend that part of, uh, liberal education. And I, I paraphrase a teacher of mine and putting it very simply that just as in life every day, we should think before we act. So a time spent in liberal education, and let's say we've decided for all kinds, in my opinion, all kinds of accidental reasons <clears throat> as a culture or society to locate that, perhaps paradigmatically in the college years, to think before acting with the rest of our lives. Montaigne speaks that way, in fact, um, uh, in, in the essay. <clears throat> and I, I would defend that. I think there are paradoxes involved in that. But I, I, I think that's very important. So that side of it, if we become completely preoccupied with any itinerary that's coming at us from, you know, compelling us to uh, spend our time in words and deeds that are outside of the various kinds of inquiries that we want to undertake, then there's going to be less time and attention for those inquiries. Um, so there needs to be a, a, a sense if you want to call it that, a sense of withdrawal. But to the degree to which, but that first of all, that's never total, can't be, um, never has been, never will be. That's one of the paradoxes, let's say. You have to decide. It's a relative uh, balancing always and never a binary uh, situation. Um, but uh, incidentally, you know, that, that the World War II drama, of course, much of what happened at St. John's, uh, and this is described in the, the book as it happened as happened at so many other colleges is students had to decide 
whether they were going to stay and continue their, their education or whether they were going to enlist, um, uh, at least for the times when they had, had a choice. Um, uh, and those discussions are described in that book. So, so that, that's the point that, that I was trying to make. And I do believe the education is practical in that sense. And we say this, things like this all the time. We say in the statement of the program, we say it in our, in our shorter mission statement that this kind of education, and my, my goodness, do the founders in the 30s want to hammer this. This is preparation for responsible action and responsible action, practical action in the world as, as citizens. Uh, that encompasses all the greatest challenges of the day. <clears throat> and I believe the habits of mind and character and intellect and speech that we cultivate here are precisely that kind of Odyssean resourcefulness to use one image, uh, but of course one could make tighter connections in terms of how, how, how it prepares you for practical life. I'm being playful with the Euclid, but I mean it quite seriously. And sometimes I say my utopian ideal would be if everybody just had to do freshman math, as it were, in the world. If everybody had to spend a year doing what we do with Euclid, uh, I think that you know the, the 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 streams would run with milk and honey. It's it's actually uh, an incredible education for uh, uh, understanding the common world that we have to share as citizens and what it means to find our shared assumptions and to speak about them and to understand when we're not saying the same thing and, and why. I, I, I actually think the study of Euclid is highly political and practical in, in a number of senses, just to take something that might seem abstruse. So it's a little tough, right? This is one of the issues with this format. I I'm not making eye contact with the questioner. Uh, I can't easily go back and say, um, you know, say, uh, do you want to say more? So I've got to avoid my tendency to just keep talking. So just let me stop stop there because I imagine that the question will weave in other ways. Um, I have another, another question. So in the cases where people didn't make it anonymous, I'll just say this is a question from um, Mr. Starr, Nicholas Starr, Nick Starr. Thank you, Mr. Starr. Uh, thank you for the lecture, Dean Sterling. Can you specify what you think are the greatest obstacles to education as conceived by St. John's today? And how might we as tutors and students respond to those challenges? Uh, well, there are many, there are many. Um, uh, I, I think it's fair to say liberal education to the degree to which we think there's such a thing, and this is what the founders thought, such a thing that has been incarnated in, in various ways, but share certain common ideals, practices, and so on, say through the Western tradition, and I believe in, in other traditions. Um, uh, it, it, it's always counter-cultural in certain senses, um, and, and we can spell that out, but it's, it, it, it never has all the wind at its back. It's always got to be, um, in a certain sense, challenged by whatever, uh, uh, just broadly speaking, whatever the reigning dogmas of the age are, political or religious, um, and let's say in, in a broad sense, political and religious, there's some version of that that's, that's all, that always holds sway. Uh, and that can, that can both, uh, I guess I'm tempted to say, for every, for every age, every regime, um, you, you're always having to whether you're a student who's drawn to it or whether you're a teacher or a leader who wants to, so to speak, convert people to the task of, of deep liberal education, it's, you've always got to get past more obvious goods and choices that in a certain way the, the society is always encouraging you towards. It's always a second thought, even when it has the greatest public approval or has come up with the, with the greatest kind of rhetorical harmony with the regime. So it, it's always a challenge. Uh, and uh, there are many challenges. 
what what I what I think about today is I mean what was on my mind in connecting with Montaigne and you know I don't know I don't know if I think this is the greatest obstacle to education simply I think it's something more like the challenge in our lives that makes the journey to the kind of thoughtfulness and engagement that whether we call it liberal education or philosophy or simply deep reflection and inquiry into things I, I think the, the um, feedback loop between the um, digital technologies, the internet, the ubiquity of screens, you could call it, I'll call it in, for these purposes, the attention economy. <clears throat> and the way the attention economy is now technologically inserted uh, into so much of our space and our time and our lives and the feedback loop between that and the financial incentives that are tied into it and the information that we end up getting and the way that habituates us to think. Uh, I think that's, that's one of the toxicities that, that, we're, that we're wrestling with. Um, I think just objectively, it's, it's having a kind of negative, measurable negative effect on our collective mental health. It's having a negative effect on our ability to attend to things. Uh, and our behavior is so strongly conditioned in ways that it, it wasn't before. I mean, I'm speaking just as, just as an observer with no special perch. Uh, uh, but it seems to me to have gone, so to speak, from zero to whatever the right number is now, billions of the, the world's population being absolutely attached to a cell phone that they're looking at on average, whatever the number is, 20 times a day, 120, I think it's somewhere in between there. <clears throat> That's a behavioral modification of the most dramatic sort. I, I mean, really, how many things like that have happened in, in the history of, of human civilization? I think they're probably a handful, but I, I mean, a handful. Uh, so, you know, we're still digesting this. And <clears throat> I'm not sure that I think that's the deepest obstacle to our form of education, because I actually think the, the felt, the pathos of it, um, uh, finally highlights the need and becomes an argument for the kind of work that we do and the kind of study that we do. And of course, not just us, man, many other people out there. So I actually think that, that the backlash is very useful for people finding their way to this, but it's also harder. Uh, our habits of mind are, I think, are, are further away from what it means to, and I, I do think there's a kind of absoluteness to, to, to pace and space and time of what it looks like to um, think deeply about things, to stay with something, to work on something, to work on something together. You know, those are things that you don't just turn dials on and say, well, if we've, you know, if we've got less attention, we'll do, you know, we'll do Euclid and TikTok bites. Um, so I don't, Mr. Starr, I, I don't feel like I'm giving even my maybe most heartfelt answer to this, but it's what, it's what was on my mind in seeing in what I'll now call Montaigne's exercises, a kind of, um, uh, a kind of antidote or a kind of spur that, that reflex and the reflex that I think is valuable for liberal education that we uh, that we uh, that we step back um, and um, and try to take possession of ourselves. My list of what I see as obstacles are so long. I, I think I'm going to pause there and and go to another an, another question because the next two or three things that are occurring to me will be long, long answer, uh, maybe even longer answers on that point. Okay. Um, Barry Rabe, if I'm saying that right, I think I am.
Montaigne had to navigate some difficult times politically. Do you think we can learn anything from him? Uh, excuse me. And then I see we have a couple hands up. I'll go to this next. Learn anything from him that would improve political discourse in the United States today? Uh, yes. Yes. I mean, I didn't, you know, that's the other side of what I said that I thought, uh, you know, our, from my point of view, and this is pre-pandemic, so you know I have to try to understand how you know how the world will change through this, and 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 you know what else comes. But I see the two great pathologies of of our current moment, and maybe I'll mean by that the last ten to twenty years, and both of them accelerating or intensifying are the technological phenomenon that I just alluded to. And um, uh, our, you could call it different things, our polarized, hyper-polarized, hyper-partisan political environment, which is um, in which the middle seems to have been drained um, of value. Uh, we've seen things like that before, but, um, and I myself have, have always wanted to resist the idea that things just keep getting, say, less and less civil in politics, because we know that, that there's been all kinds of smash mouth politics for, for a long time in this, in this polity, in this republic. <clears throat> but it, it, it seems to me the chorus of observers who are trying to look at things in balanced ways see it as going down and down in some in some important way, and then there's a obviously a feedback loop to that. So it's partly the it's partly the uh, lack of common ground, lack of um, a, a, a sense of being united by more than what divides us. Um, but it's also the effect uh, of of groupthink and getting trapped in our own in our own echo chambers, which seems to be the way media, journalism, uh, entertainment, communications, digital communications, and maybe other features of, of life, um, um, a certain kind of geographic sorting uh, that's, that's happened in, in, in some ways. The, the, those seem to me to be the problems. So, Montaigne, like most of the early modern political philosophers, if there's one thing, one problem they're trying to solve, it's sectarian religious conflict and political civil war that largely maps onto that. And Montaigne is sort of, with, with Hobbes following closely on his heels and maybe Machiavelli in some way being there first, but Montaigne is the one. Now he he gives his treatment of this as directly political or religious commentary, a very light touch, um, uh, but it's, it's scattered throughout the essays. But without a doubt, he, he's, I mean, it's the clearest consequence of his skepticism is the idea that we would become sufficiently uh, uh, sufficiently self-critical to uh, loosen the violence, uh, violent passion with which we want to assert um, uh, orthodoxy, political or religious or ideological orthodoxy. So in a way, all of his intellectual exercises, I think, have that as, as their purpose. It can go different directions, right? One thread of Montaigne seems to be it appears at times the way he applies that to himself is just kind of go along with whatever the main law of the land is. So in that sense, you're sort of asking, it's not quite a neutral playing field. It sounds like you're asking the dissent, you know, the minority, the dissenters to get back in, in line. And that's a little bit different than um, sort of asking everybody to lay down their, their weapons. So it can play out in different ways, but I, I, but I think Montaigne was deeply concerned with trying to establish conditions for reasoned disagreement, civil disagreement, including about um, deep things. Uh, I think he 
you know, again, maybe is there first uh, with the idea that, that um, uh, the, the theological positions that are out there will never command universal assent. They're too dubitable. And if we have political regimes that are going to demand that, we are going to have, you know, we're going to have um, war, we're going to have divisions. And the only way we're going to have a common space for political discourse is if people make some distinction between those things they believe that can't require universal assent. And that's why at one point I said freedom, I think I said freedom of the intellect and, and conscience, perhaps. It's, you know, you're not, I don't think you're going to find in Montaigne a, you know, a clear development of the idea of a sort of argument for freedom of conscience, but it goes in that direction. And, and you know, certainly his comments about cruelty, not just what I quoted, but the way in which he sees cruelty, barbarity, as he says in On Cannibals, <clears throat> more, right, in the civil wars, the religious wars that he's witnessing than in the barbarian uh, peoples and, and in other times and places, maybe more than in classical antiquity. Uh, he, he, he wants people to realize that those are not the things that, that, we, should, that we should fight, you know, fight over in that way. Um, uh, so the, the skepticism, the, the um, you, you know, it, again, if you don't identify strongly with skepticism, the, and, and I'm not in the way I presented it, more kind of open-ended and reflexive um, searching of experience where we try to become more and more effective connoisseurs uh, of particulars that we encounter and good judges of character and action and decision and so on. But understanding that to be a very open-ended dialectical process, one where we want to be self-critical, where we want to encounter opposing opinions and so on. I mean, that's, where, you know, when I, just in, in, in the way I talk to myself about the world, I, I really believe at the very heart of, of intellectual liberation, you really have to become passionate about wanting to have your own views challenged um, um, and challenging them yourself, but wanting to hear the strongest arguments. And, and that's maybe always a, a rare thing. I think we need to cultivate it, but it seems to me it's gone. The political, the problem with political discourse that we have is that, uh, I mean, you can watch a lot of um, news without hearing anybody do anything that resembles that. And I think that's changed. I think that's changed. Um, so that, that's, that's a yes, and uh, I hope I've spoken to it some. Okay, we have a couple hands up here. So uh, Julia Simonitis, I'm gonna first allow you to talk. Uh, are you there? Hello. Hi, would you like me to turn your video on? Um, actually, that's pretty poor lighting right now, so okay. Okay, that's I'll fine. Talk at you facelessly. All right. Um, I was, I don't know, I was very interested by your, I guess, one point ago discussion of like the modern culture of attention. And this, I mean, sort of personally, in pursuing my St. John's education, um, I've definitely had to withdraw from staying up to date in the culture of attention just to have enough attention to place on the program, which I think is also probably in line with Montaigne's educational model. Of, like in order to make something entirely my own, I have to spend a lot of time with it. But at St. John's, we also talk about what it means to be a citizen and our place in society. And the culture of attention moves so quickly that I also can't help feel that I'm like completely removing myself from society or losing something. And I wonder if I have a responsibility to pay more attention. So I'm wondering how you see the balance between removing to invest in my skills and my ability as a citizen, but also my responsibility to take part in what's going on around me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, 
it, I mean, it occurs to me, I'm just going to play with your question a couple of different ways. Okay. You know, one, I mean, one is the, like one way to hear it is something like this. If I withdraw too much while I'm here, when I need to go back, will I be somehow behind or impaired? Another, another way is to say, while I'm here, am I, am I failing to be engaged in, 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 in a way that I should be? And there might be some connection between those two. It, it wasn't actually entirely clear to me if you went, meant one or the other, but I might just, you can clarify if you want, but I might just play with both a little bit. Yeah, that, I definitely was reflecting on both of those things in terms of like, should I be participating now? And will I be able to participate when I return to society? So, you know, despite my saying that, that um, these phenomena, these very challenges, technology, technology, politics, and so on, that I think they're changing, they're escalating. And, and, you know, they, you could, say with the technology piece that maybe, and at least in the form that I'm talking about, it's only you know, 10, 15 years old. So it could seem like things change fast. My own view is if a student came here and said, I I'm gonna devote my 100% of my time to doing this while I'm here for the next four years, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm whatever, maybe you need your computer for your papers, but I'm smashing, the phone and I'm, I'm getting rid of my social media and I'm not going to watch the news and I'm just going to check out of society while I do the work here. My, my own somewhat flip view is when you check back in in four years, nothing's going to have changed. I mean, it's all going to still be there waiting for you. Things will be recognizable. Um, uh, shockingly, maybe disappointingly recognizable. Um, uh, now, whether that's a good way to live while you're here, even apart from the question of political engagement, and, and I mean, this is something that's on my mind. I, you know, we, uh, I was thinking about this a little bit on the side with Mr. Starr's question, and maybe this goes back to a little bit of my wanting to exaggerate one position to counterbalance another. You know, when we talk about the college to, to outsiders, prospective students who say, well, one of the remarkable things is you sit down in the dining hall and the conversation is, is still going on and you hear a different kind of conversation than you're going to hear at the University of Michigan or uh, USC or wherever it is. And of course, there's some truth to that, but I also think that there's some exaggeration to that. It, my experience as a student was that I also had friends where the friendship was based on other things than what we were doing in the classroom. And it, it was sort of wonderful that we had that as a shared foundation. But it seems to me you as students have layered lives even while you're here. And it's part of what I was trying to capture with that search and rescue photo. I, I think the college is more fully realizing itself when some students are doing search and rescue vigorously, even while they're being students here. And some are doing theater vigorously, even while they're being students here. And the sense that those are sort of, that those might be compromises or intrusions, I think that's a, just a distortion of life. That's a little bit different than politics, except it touches that question of how much you're gonna withdraw just to do the thinking here. I think you're, you're trying to, we're all right, trying to mature or grow into fuller, more able versions of the, the, the people that we want to be. And that doesn't just happen through the books in the classroom. Now you give a lot of yourself to the books in the classroom if you're going to get from this what you're going to get. But there should be other things for some people that might be a kind of ongoing political awareness. When I was a student, that looked like a few students who were sort of famous for going, because this is how it looked in 1988, going to the library and reading the New York Times and the Washington Post every day. And there were a couple students I knew who did that. And they were flagging themselves as, you know, we're the ones who are not going to lose track of what's going on in the outside world because we want to do things uh, when we go back there. Um, you know, so whatever that looks like for someone who's interested in those things now, I certainly think that can be part of it. But I don't think, I mean, I believe strongly that, and, and I think actually Montaigne 
would reinforce this. If the question is, not that this is what you'd be thinking about, presumably, I'm, I, I won't get too sarcastic around this, but if, if the question is, should I go to that city council meeting or read a couple more of Plutarch's lives? I think Montaigne would say, you're gonna get much more education for citizenship that will serve you well for the rest of your life if you use a few hours when you're a college freshman, sophomore, junior, or senior to read a couple more of Plutarch's lives than if you go to uh, that city council meeting. At some point, being a citizen means doing something like going to the city council meeting and being effective, doing your civic duties, trying to persuade people and so on. So it's not as though, that's a different question, right? Because somebody might say, well, if it's better when I'm a freshman, won't it be better when I'm 30, 40, and 50 to spend a couple hours reading Plutarch? And then we get into a deeper question about you know, the life of the mind versus the political life. But I certainly believe the college's position is that most of our students need, and this is the great synergy between liberal education and liberal democracy, and in a way liberal education owes it to liberal democracy as the regime that has best sheltered the freedom of inquiry. Um, this is a side point, but in any event, most of us will go out and, and act in the world one way or the other. And at some point you won't have the leisure and luxury, or it won't be the same kind of weighing of two more hours with Plutarch. So why not get that education while you can? Um, and Mont Montaigne says explicitly at one point, he says, he's not thinking in terms of four years of college, but he says, we, you have this for the first 15 or 16 years, then you'll spend the, re the rest of your life in action. So make the most, don't aim low, aim high. And, you know, and that's, I think, kind of what we exhort you to do here. Okay. So, so my claim is you'll be well equipped when you leave here, if you see the education through deeply, you'll be well equipped for political action and citizenship when you leave. The question of how you weigh the obligations and demands you feel while you're here, I think is fascinating. One, uh, there's a student who I didn't know well until we had a couple conversations about this, but an incredibly thoughtful, sophisticated student who believes so passionately in a certain cause and that it was so urgent that he decided he couldn't, it was making him kind of ill to stay at the college and go to class when he felt like every day not serving that cause, um, he, he was judging himself for. And so he, he's taking time off, intending to come back after a year or two of, um, of service at which he thinks there'll be a kind of inflection point and he can, take a, he can take a step back. I think those are profound kinds of, profound kinds of questions to wrestle with. And I, I don't view it as my job to, to tell anybody how to weigh them. I mean, I, I said to him, my honest opinion was that that cause too would still be waiting for him and that he'd probably be better served if he wants to be as impactful as possible racing to a certain kind of PhD or advanced degree or career position. That's not what he can do by taking time off and volunteering, but that's my own assessment. And, and first of all, I could be wrong, but secondly, he's the one that's got to weigh that and, and choose. And that's the sense in, in terms of how I was addressing the first anonymous question about the practical, we never get to flick a switch and say, we made the decision. We're going to live the life of the mind for a time. And this is when it's going to, stop and then we're going to go back to the to the life of action well equipped we we can't do that to ourselves there's, there's no switch to do that with every day in a certain sense brings the question of what what am i going to do that day now we don't feel every day with the same existential weight as we do a decision to start a uh, school or start uh, a career uh, but you know in times where many people feel very strongly uh, uh, about certain things some folks might say, maybe Montaigne would say, interrogate some of that passion that you're feeling because that might be excessive. It might not even serve well the end that matters most in there. And, and I have a little bit of that, that in me. But even if that's the case, you're, you're still going to face, face choices. I've, you know, I've known students who've left in the middle of their time here to say to join the military. Um, I think decisions like that are fascinating. As I say, many students face that during World War II, of course, they, you know, in a certain sense, some students 
wrestle with a question like that, at, you know, at, always, you know, whatever the, the larger political situation. Okay, let, let me take a breath, Miss Miss Simonitis, and see and see if you want to if you want to follow follow back up or if I've if I've spoken to it at all. Yeah, no, I um, I really appreciate that because it's also sort of highlighting for me the fact that there needs to be a certain conviction. And if my conviction is to develop myself as much as I can as a capable citizen um, who can exact change after my time at St. John's, then the investment is worth removing myself. But if my, um, if my commitment is to exact as much change as I want to right now, then the time spent in education um, is maybe not worth it to me personally. But I mean, what I've, what I've enjoyed hearing from you is that beneath this course of action is a sort of conviction, um, not a perceived obligation, but a belief in the best course for myself, um, which I appreciate. I, I like that way of, of putting it and I don't know, you know I mean, it, you didn't necessarily connect it in your own case to the particular challenges of the moment, but part of what I was saying in the very opening, and just part of why I myself find it both necessary and kind of renewing to go back over kind of our source documents and so on. That's not even the best way to put it, but um, this environment that we're in, it's hard to take anything for granted. I mean, this summer, yeah, even right now, and they might be listening. I actually haven't checked, but you know, my, I mean, my sons in, in uh, fourth and sixth grade, right? Serious discussions about whether school is worth doing under these conditions and, and so on. And right. It's easy for me to say at the end of all those discussions, it's, you know, it's my decision. I've my wife's and, and my decision. Uh, but of course we don't want them to feel like something bizarre and perverse is being done to them. But so just that sense of the inevitability of walking down paths we're on, it seems to me that, that the pandemic has <laughs> just that, right, has thrown, has thrown a lot of that into question for, for a lot of us. And when I think about the college or again, college education everywhere <clears throat> right now, it, it, if I, if, if I were a student and I have to ask it, myself, I, know, I mean, I know my answers, but if I were a student, I'd sort of be asking myself, I feel like I'd have to be asking myself, why am I doing this? It's so different than, you know, what I pictured, what I wanted and so on. So, so what, what is the heart of it for me? My hope is that St. John students have better answers. I think you can and should have better answers than a lot of students. But I think we're in a time where, where we're, we're all being asked to reflect we've sort of been put on our heels, we have to reflect on what it is, the heart of what we're going to do, because almost anything we're going to do right now is going to be under conditions that, that are not what we pictured, not what we'd hoped for. Uh, we want them to change. Um, uh, maybe not you know, true for everybody at this point, but certainly for a lot of folks. So, Okay. Um, thank you, Mr. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to take... Um, uh, I'm gonna, sorry folks, I gotta do a little of my work here. There was, oh no, did I accidentally, I might've accidentally lowered a hand. There was a hand that was up. I think it was here. Paula maybe? Yes, there. Uh, sorry, I'm gonna allow you to talk. All right, um, trying. Can you unmute yourself now? Is that is that working? Yes, yes. And would you like for me to turn the video on or just leave it at audio? I really don't care. I am dressed, so, <laughs> so you can do what you wish. I, I will turn the video on if I can quickly okay. figure out how to do that. Uh, you may as well practice. This isn't going to be the last time you do this. <laughs> You know what? I'm not even seeing a way to do that. Just, uh, I'm sorry, Paul. Like, That's okay. Go ahead and ask your question. Uh, and now I need to get rid of the little box that's covering your face that wants me to mute or not mute. The host, was there? No. Okay, well, we can hear you, so. Oh.
Okay. Sure. Oh, all right, great. Uh, it, listening to your last uh, discussion changed what I wanted to talk about. And maybe there'll be time to do both. But when I first started taking these classes and you know where I started with my first with Montaigne and I was never going to go back to him again and whatever and so um, staying after school that day you changed my mind. So one of the questions that I have thought a lot about in getting into the great books for the first time in my life is was I doing this for my enjoyment or anything else? the answer is wouldn't it be a shame if I just put this in my memory bank and did nothing with it that I didn't apply it to my life didn't I apply it to to um, bettering my life around me so you know it took me quite a while to get to that because I just thought just the enjoyment of learning is enough so I just am throwing that into what you were just discussing. And then what I was really wanting to talk about was I, I had read last night Montaigne's essay on imagination in preparation for our next workshop in Ohio. And after he got through, I would have broken that essay into two parts. Uh, one was sex education for the mature man, and then the other was, you know, and I understood why he was using that example and, and imagination. But I, I, the, the amount of essays, the diversity of subjects that he has written about and deeply thought about and practiced, um, is imagination not his center core for everything? So that's that's where I am at this point. Okay. And and the it, it isn't a question necessarily has to be answered. It's right. just that you know when I wish I had read his essay on um, imagination earlier. Mm -hmm before the other yeah well that's it's it's interesting so I'm, I'm gonna go ahead and, and mute you and as people heard Paul is one of the participants in the seminars uh, who I was thanking at the start and we're, we're continuing to read some Montaigne um, so the um, the I, I, I'm not gonna give a long ans answer to this I mean it highlights Montaigne's unsystematic way of treating these things. So I think there are times where he talks about imagination and it's as though imagination is the, the, the ground, the grund, the, or, the er faculty, um, partly because it, you know, imagination sort of as such is, tran is transgressive. It opens up more uh, as possible, you might say, then is possible, and that's the space we we live in. His he he sometimes identifies that all the fruits of the essays as as products of imagination. Um, I mean, this is part of why the experience essay is, I think, so final in many ways because I do think he tours in that essay through all, in a sense, all of the characteristic human faculties and imagination shows up there too. And um, so imagination is involved in judgment uh, uh, in, in a number of ways. Certainly the problems that we have with, with error, uh, if they're problems, by the time you're done reading Montaigne, you, you might be so content that they stop seem, seeming like problems. But the problems we have with error, the problems we have with appetite, imagination is 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 tied up in those things. So it the sort of abundance that comes from imagination sets the terms for much of what has to be worked out 
then uh, disciplined, corrected for, and so on. That's a kind of critical way to put it. Um, I, you know, I think I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to leave it there because I don't have my arms around that essay right now. And I think that, you know, the main point is at different times, it does look like different faculties uh, are presented as more or less fundamental. Uh, and imagination is certainly one of the ones that rec recurs. I, I don't think finally he identifies, um, I mean, you might, you might put it this way. It, it looks as though improving, perfecting, that's not really a good Montanian word, but I'll just say perfecting one's judgment is very close to fulfilling the, the human good. I, I don't think he'd talk about imagination that way. Enhancing, perfecting, training our imagination. Not that he's not thinking about that, but that's not the axis that's going to lead us to the, the, full, the fullest actualities and, and fulfillments, I think, that, that he cares about. So, Paul, I've, I've got some other, you might have a follow-up, but I've got some other questions coming in, so I want to go ahead and, and, and take them first. Um, let's see, I, I have one that came in, actually a couple, so I don't, I don't know the order things are coming in. Um, could you maybe say a bit more about how the various practices of the college might be understood as aimed at the cultivation of judgment? Well, I mean, it sort of, it sort of depends on, on how, much, how much valence you give to that, to that term. Um, I mean, there's, there's, there's a way you could talk about, and I think this is how Montaigne thinks, judgments in play with our thinking and talking and choosing all the time. And uh, that's true, um, you know, picking the right formulation to explain the next step in a proof is a matter of, of judgment. And through practice and trial and error and careful observation of others and self-criticism and so on, you become better at that. And somebody might say, but that's not judgment really, that's, that's a form of intellect, it's somewhere on the divided line, uh, it has to do with our understanding. Well, uh, insight into mathematical truth, um, uh, ability to see that a, um, uh, that a consequence follows from premises, uh, those, let's say, are not matters of judgment, but choosing the right articulation or understanding the the, 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 you know, you might say the one thing needful at a certain moment in response to a question or how to bridge a gap in somebody's understanding. Those are, those are matters that admit of infinite uh, refinement, infinite criticism. Um, you know, somebody might get off the hook the other way and say, but that's just a knack and you can't cultivate it. And well, I, I don't think there are many things in life that are actually like that. Um, there are there are some, uh, but uh, the things we call knacks often involve uh, hidden faculties, and um, even what's a knack can maybe be improved uh, by reflection, and art and artifice. So I think we're doing it all the time. Um, we're doing it all the time, uh, and maybe the posture. I mean, maybe I'd say this. Part of what I was trying to stress at the end uh, is, uh, <clears throat> is that Montaigne is inviting us to, um, and I think it's very exciting, to an attentive wakefulness. I mean, that's the, that's the ownership piece. Um, and this, this gets back to you know, the technology and, and the concerns I was expressing in relation to Mr. Starr's question. You know, I mean, right at the heart of the Platonic enterprise and right at the heart of the Montanian enterprise 
is to realize, I'll put an extreme harsh way of putting this, how automated we are uh, all the time. Um, you say by what, right? Habit, tradition, law, the authority of our parents, how we were brought up, whatever it is. But the very fact that we can articulate those things means we have some critical distance on them. But our own, our, the way our characters get formed, habits of mind, the, the, the vocabulary that's cemented for us on certain things. Um, you know, we could chase an impossible freedom of saying we want to take all that apart, lay it all out on a table and reassemble a better version. That's not possible, right? What's possible is imminent critique, flowing self-critique and improvement. But you have to own the, the problem and it's not easy. Right, it's not easy. And, and I think there are many philosophers, many of the greatest philosophers and great religious thinkers, you finish reading them and you say, you know, the degree to which they're saying, um, I mean, this, this comes out in the sort of, you know, Hades image in, in, in the Mino, the degree to which they're saying, everybody's so asleep so much of the time. And that aspect of our experience is really beneath us as human beings, and we ought to wake up. Uh, and again, that could be chased, right? The extreme, the, the presumably apocryphal vision of Aristotle, like holding something to keep himself from falling asleep so they can keep contemplating all the time. That's, that's inhuman. Montaigne's very concerned to clip the wings of that kind of inhuman tendency, which I think he thinks, and I think rightly, is an issue with uh, classical philosophy as well, maybe as with, with Christian theology, but, um, but that wakefulness. And, and I, I know I'm taking a while to get to this. I think St. John's, again, I'd be prepared to say liberal education generally, but St. John's, if it's about anything, I think it's trying to, to wake, us, wake us up, make us active, active readers active in rebuilding so much of what we take in passively otherwise. And again, not to chase it to a bad infinity. Some of us do that. That's a risk maybe, but to understand it as, as something we get better at by doing it and we're able to moderate it, keep it human by doing it, doing it effectively, seeing where we make progress, understanding what that looks like, replicating that in other areas and I think that wakefulness it just is a kind of refinement of, of judgment. And it applies to how we ask questions in class. It applies to how you read. It applies to how you think through the steps. It applies to how you study your own habits of memorization or digestion uh, of, of things. Judgment, not just for Montaigne, but, but for Aristotle, for other thinkers, judgment saturates uh, our experience in, in, in many ways. And, and, but this is what I would call the common thread when you're, when you understand owning your judgment as a way to try to get some leverage against the, the, um, the ventriloquism, uh, the automation, uh, of life. Now then that's, you know, that's exciting. It's hard work. I think St. John's is very much about that. And, and I think Montaigne is, is really, very much about that. And I, and I think that's sort of what his retreat to his tower symbolizes. I mean, not, he's, he was obviously a very well-educated, active man, and he exaggerates his retirement. He was politically active after that. But, you know, he was, when you, when you do a lot and you're asked to do a lot and you have duties imposed upon you and you take them seriously, you know, you spend years, right? running a certain kind of sprint and you get better at things and so on. And Montaigne, I think, did that with part of his life. And this might be not as strong as the, as, well, no, I'll say it. I think at a certain point, he, he wanted to put the brakes on that as its own inertia and, and, uh, and automatic. And he wanted to use all of that then as fuel for a kind of wakeful um, further development of, uh, of, of his character uh, and intellect and, and who, who could have been more successful. So, um, okay, I'm gonna go back and forth here a little bit. Uh, Cameron Mulvey, 
you suggested that the founding of the program was at least in part a reaction to a sense of rupture with the past and perhaps a means to address the burgeoning sense of entering into a new kind of world. Yet the program in seeking to weave together a tapestry of thought that unites the ancient and the modern seems to implicitly reject the idea that the modern world is in any fundamental sense out of sync with what came before. How can we think about the value of a program that asserts the permanent value of, for example, Plato in a world in which permanent value is itself regularly or even paradigmatically doubted. I'm, I'm moving a little slowly because I'm, I'm not connecting the last question. I think, uh, I think I'm missing a little bit the chain and train of thought that gets the last question out of what came before. Let me talk about what came before and then look at the last question again. So, um, so rupture, well, I, I really want to just take on this one part of what you said. I think this is a, I think this is one of the deep ambiguities uh, to, to the program. And, you know, maybe it leads me to want to say at this point, that I think it's very important that we have competing understandings of the rationale and logic for the program and its particularity. That is to say, we there there may there may be general formulations that say we as a faculty and college community uh, share um, that uh, rationales that we share for the program, but they they have to be hypothetical and and partial so you know it seems i mean it seems to me if you're so let me take a step back i see the the arc of the ancients and moderns in the program in what i consider one of the ways of looking at it as setting up a dialogue a contest uh, of ideas um and you know to use language i, I think think going back to Buchanan's catalog, you, you see language like we don't assume, right, that the ancients were superior to the moderns, that there's been decline, nor do we assume that truth is the, is the child of time and that there's been progress that, that, you know, if you accept, and some people want to challenge this maybe, but if you accept that there are fundamental disagreements uh, among the authors generally, uh, but especially between ancients and moderns, between Athens and Jerusalem, between the philosophers and the poets, the sort of great quarrels, then, uh, uh, then we're putting before you a contest about ultimate things and the college is not taking a position uh, about them. It's an interesting place to try to be as a community, that interpretation. Um, it's an interesting thing to try to defend even. Uh, I think we make a go of it in some of our documents. I think others would say uh, that we don't want to exaggerate the contest, that great thinkers tend to alight on some common truths. And maybe it's not about the doctrines they disagree about. Maybe what makes them great is the way they're thinking. And that might be a common thread. Um, and sometimes you see that kind of writing that all the works we study, anything we say all about, it's going to be wrong, but let's say all the works we study are, you know, great examples of exercises in the liberal arts. Uh, and, and then you could say we're sort of studying them all for the same thing and we're not as focused on doctrinal difference or something like that. Then I think there is the other interpretation, which is while some questions are open, there also has been advance, something like irreversible advance. Uh, I don't think we try to keep the same dialogue open around stages in the development of natural science in the same way that we at least allege to um, about religious, political, and ethical things. But I think some people might wonder whether those latter questions are so open for us. And, and I think that, that, you know, that gets really, really interesting uh, too. So 
I actually think the college is stronger if we have different interpretations of the logic of the program. And, and, and furthermore, what I started to say before was, if you assume among the students or among the faculty, among our alumni, that we have believers, non-believers, we have Platonists, Nietzscheans, Kantians, I don't see how in the end your full understanding of the value of this sort of education can really uh, be the same if your fundamental answers to those fundamental questions that divide those schools of thought or positions are different. It seems to me you can agree about lots of it. And, and where you disagree might not matter practically. It might not matter for um, finding shared benefits in what we do, but the full account would have to be would have to be different. So that was all a response to the idea that the, that the assertion that uh, we reject the idea the modern world is fundamentally, in any fundamental sense, out of sync with what came before. I, I don't, I myself see it as more a battle of gods and giants, a sort of titanic struggle that we benefit from because we see that the most brilliant minds, the most capable minds do not converge. Uh, on um, uh, shared answers to the deepest questions. That's that's how I that's how I read the books. That's an important insight for 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 many reasons, um, and it's a liberating one because maybe in ways that can also produce vertigo, but finally shouldn't. It puts you in the position of, of having to own your own, you know, your own um, insight, your own decision in a way that. It's very, mon very Montanian. How can we think about the value of a program that asserts the permanent value, Plato in a world in which permanent value is itself, right? Yeah, well, this is, I mean, this goes to what I was saying. C certainly some of us believe that, um, well, let me take a step back because you could just, you could be talking about just the normal way, let's say, the convictions. Um, I mean, we know, we know, for example, I don't know what example to pick. We could beat up on phlogiston, but I kind of want to go. I kind of want to go deeper. Um, um, well, I don't want to digress too much on this, but um, I mean, one could add, one could ask the question this way. You know, we. I mean, we do take I think very very seriously very untimely ideas in the in the books. But how many, how many of us on our campuses um, seriously consider the idea that monarchy might be better than democracy and that we might want to live our lives in light of that and in order to advance, advance that? Um, you know, I don't th the way in which we take seriously arguments for monarchy and Plato, Aristotle, Hobbes, wherever we might find him, Dante. <clears throat> we um, uh, there's some sense in which I think for many of us there's some sense in which the irreversibility of history does uh, deeply um, influence how we read untimely things. So that's one observation. Um, but where I was going to go before I, before I went there is just to say that that opposition between Plato and our world and the way you put it, a world where permanent value is itself doubted, well, that's the leverage we need, right? Um, you know, we... Of course, we might reject this, but I think the premise of liberal education, gently put, um, importantly gently put when we're talking about our own regimes and talking about liberal democracy in particular, is that every regime is a cave. We're all in a cave. And there might be, a, <laughs> there, there better be a number of ways, if ascent from the cave is possible, that we can get traction. Um, but one of them is, thank God, the existence of great works of art 
that hold fundamentally different views that have somehow been spared um, the, the dustbin of history, uh, the book burnings, uh, the changes in languages. Um, so in that sense, it's critical. That's part of, that's part of why we want the heterogeneity of, of ideas. And again, for almost any of us defending that view, it means we want to read in the context of this sort of education. We have to, if we've come to certain convictions, they're going to align with some of the books, and not align with others. And yet we think the education is better for having those things that we think are false. I feel that way. They're books that I think, you know, to use the sort of Plato's lie in the soul language, many of the books on the program that I think are uh, wrong about the most important thing and the most important part of us. Um, and I think it's critical that, that, that they be read and that it would deform the education if we removed those very faults. Um, uh, and even, I mean, I'm getting a little rhetorically worked up here and even pernicious text. So that, that, that sense of needing the leverage of heterogeneity of ideas, deep heterogeneity of ideas, uh, that's part of the rationale for a great books program that spans, you know, that, that's, and it doesn't have to be this set, we could discuss that, but spans a range and is not narrowly designed to build a certain, a certain world. When I went to graduate school in philosophy, I, I had a peer who, I mean, it's only sl a slight exaggeration that he'd entered a PhD program reading no texts before Heidegger. His first encounter, the decisive encounter for him with philosophy was Heidegger, and he understood that as irreversible progress in where philosophy was, and he was interested in Heidegger forward. And he was genuinely perplexed why I or some of the rest of us thought we'd still want to read Plato, Descartes, Kant, Hegel, and so on. Now, he understood to become a philosophy professor, he's going to have to do some of that. But for him, that was pretty close to necessary evil. And that's, it's a little hard for me to defend since I disagree with it so strongly, but there's an intelligibility to that. Once we know what our foundations are, should we build an education that's, um, that's on those premises, coherent, takes us from A to Z and doesn't involve the disruptions and ruptures. Uh, but that's not, that's, that's not going to be a liberal education almost by definition because the, the doubt, the question would be whether that foundation is, is a cave that we've constructed or reconstructed for ourselves. And the only way we can test that is by somehow challenging it, meaningfully challenging it. Okay, I, I, I think that's what I'm gonna say to, to that one. Um, uh, my friend Paul Cooley, I've always loved Montaigne for his curiosity and joy, and you find the same sort of character in Socrates. I would argue along with you, Euclid, and so many other writers on the program. It was a quality that attracted me to St. John's. How in the current political climate do we continue to bring that quality of curiosity and joy into a world so politically divided? Surely not a problem particular to our age, but somewhat amplified by our communications technology. I know this continues the themes of the other questions, but I thought I would throw it out there. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, my experience has been that our classroom and our enterprise um, does serve as a balm for the, the heat and violence of passion and disagreement that we find in other arenas of our life. Um, there, there may be three ways that I could talk about that. One, you could say, well, once we're here, everybody signed up to join the same club. So, you know, we've sort of created our own um, echo chamber, but I don't, I don't accept that. At least I want to resist it because I want to believe that we have the same spectrum of ideas that is playing itself out in, in polemical, adversarial, and, um, uh, well, I mean, we could pile on with the adjectives, condescending, 
lack of mutual understanding, lack of generosity to other opinions plays itself out that way in one environment. Here, a few things happen. If my premise is right, that we have the same spectrum of, of ideas, so it's not simply neutralized by the idea we all sort of um, got dipped in the same dye when we entered. <clears throat> the activity, I think, I mean, this is, I, this is the beauty of the intellectual life or the part of life that is intellectual in this way. Uh, um, the, the, the joy and beauty of the shared logos that can unfold Again, I take Euclid as, you know, as the paradigm, but it happens too in reading uh, a difficult political text. Uh, when, when we have premises that we're coming in as inquirers, asking questions, trying to reason together, et cetera, and the fuel that we get from the, the richness and the order of the things we study, that 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 brings folks together, you know, a great tutor, great and influ influential tutor uh, at the college who, who died tragically young, Bill O'Grady, um, wonderful uh, addition to St. John's Review, collects both his writings and, um, well, maybe there's one that's just his writings, but then there are tributes to him, I think preface to it. In any event, one of his pieces that, that made an impression on me when I first read it. I think it's titled Plato's Republic and the Search for Common Objects. And in a way, it's very, you know, for Johnny's, for readers of Plato, students of philosophy, it might sound like a banal thought, but the idea that in, I mean, this would be an extreme way to put it, simple way to put it also, in every other area of life, the ways in which goods can be shared is limited, except with the life of the mind, where there's really not an economy of scarcity. And in fact, the goods that are found there um, become more abundant through being shared. It's the kind of thought that just sort of saying the words gets me close to tearing up as much as you're gonna see when I've got my coat and tie on. But I think it's true. I, th I, think, it's, I think it's true. I'm, you know, again, depending on what your ultimate beliefs are, um, of course, that's not going to be the last word on every other part of life, but I think that's, that's the experience. Now, and I think that goes a long way towards creating a common and shared world, a world of quasi-friendship, at least, um, because doing that, sharing those goods together, um, and, and Montaigne's very, very articulate, eloquent about this in the essay on conversation. That's one response. Another thing that I used to say, and, and I, I want to keep saying it, but my own arguments are a little bit at odds with it right now. And I feel like the, um, there are changes that matter to me that, that make me a little less sanguine in saying this. But what, what I've said since I was a student working for the admissions office, taking people on tours up to being dean is if you sat down and said, we're gonna have a seminar on, I mean, this, this one was a good one for a long time. I need a new example. Let's say the war in Iraq. And the opening question is gonna be, you know, was it just for us to send troops in there? That's not gonna go well as a seminar. If we read Thucydides, this is the, you could say it's part of the sleight of hand, the beautiful and beneficial uh, leisure domain of the study of the great books. We get to talk about the same issues, refine the same parts of our thinking that would apply to the contemporary case, but because we're triangulating those issues through a seemingly distant context, author, and work of art, maybe for other reasons, intrinsic to the work of art itself, it neutralizes what that seminar on the war would have devolved into. Um, I still think that's a very powerful dynamic where I'm less sanguine about it is if somebody says, because this is kind of what I'm saying, if somebody says, well, we want to have the discussion about the war or whatever, however we want to finish that sentence. I'm, I don't want, I, I guess I don't want to say in response to that, no, let's not, because it's not going to go well. That's where I, I want to 
say that earlier logic's true about part of what can be so valuable and uniting and uh, building of common understanding and shared goods is that triangulation. At the same time, I wanna say the person who's been educated this way is gonna be most able to have that seminar directly on the war or more likely a conversation about it and so on that can be um, uh, respectful, reasoned, thoughtful, self-critical, all those things that, that it should be. Um, so, the, I mean, those are some of the ways that I think the fevered discourse of the outside world is kind of naturally healed by the medicine of this kind of intellectual inquiry. Um, thank God. I think that's a very good thing. Joy. Joy is, uh, is something that I, that, I, that I wrestle with. When I entered the, the dean's office this, this time around, I put on a card that's up on my board um, uh, uh, that, that the joy in what we experience today doing this, that, that that's the, the real thing and that that's got to be a goal. I, I, I worry sometimes that the grind like character of what we do, the difficulty, right? Sublime difficulties in some cases, maybe just <laughs> relentless quantity difficulties in other cases. I, I, I worry that there's not as much joy at the heart of the activity as I'd like there to be. And I worry about changes over time about that. I'm being you know, very, very uh, frank in saying that, but uh, I think that I think I ought to say what, what I mean about that. So I do think, I don't think working through every page of the critique of pure reason or a very difficult proposition of Apollonia should be um, a barrel of laughs, easy, shouldn't be easy. Um, but I, I think there should be a lot of delight punctuating our classroom. Um, and others, others can tell me whether there's as much delight there. Now, I wouldn't want to judge it all on this semester. I think this is a time where, um, as one of my colleagues has, has said to me in multiple conversations, stoicism is probably the philosophy for the pandemic age, maybe for our political situation. There's a lot of truth in that. I mean, I use the language of the will to persevere, right? I mean, there's, you know, I wouldn't normally be talking at the start of an academic year, kind of aiming at freshmen, with language like the will to persevere, we have to talk that way in this environment. That's a different situation. Um, but I, um, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll quote another one of my colleagues uh, in talking about why we continue stubbornly all these decades in to want to have our seminars in the evenings and have lectures on Friday evenings that we're departing from that, uh, some here. Um, and, and one of his responses is, that's the time when you'd have parties and what better party than a seminar or a lecture and question period. And I could imagine a lot of responses to that, but you know, and he, and he under, it's a tongue in cheek remark, but he means it seriously that there, that, that, that this is, a, these are choice experiences and, and that, and it should be exquisite in a way, not moment to moment, but, but there should be that, that joy at the heart of it. Okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna leave that there, Paul. I'm I'm gonna go down. John Cornell, uh, similar to other questioners, how do you see the relation between learning to belong to oneself on the one hand, and intervening in the controversies and persecutions of one's time on the other? The apology for Zebon might be read as Montaigne's major statement about the fanaticism driving the religious violence of his day. How and when does the liberal artist decide to address the thought, uh, the thought policing and extremism in their political milieu? Mm -hmm. Right. So, I mean, what? So, I don't think I'm going to say anything that uh, that that you wouldn't think of about this, Mr. Cornell. Um, I mean, first of all. The sort of matter in principle about the practicality, if that's the right word, and even that's not, I don't even, I, don't, I hesitated to say to say that philosophy is becoming practical. That's, that's not 
the word that Montaigne puts the greatest weight on. But, but in any event, I'll get past semantics here. The, the, the idea of acting in the world as the Odyssean model that, that I'm presenting and that I think aligns somewhat with what Montaigne's doing, or it's at least my reinterpretation of the, uh, of the college in this context. That doesn't mean you have to go right at the heart of you know, the biggest controversies of the age or even be politically active in the way that one um, might think. It can be, uh, I think many of us think this way, that, that you know, say, uh, um, well, I don't know, but small acts, local acts, the formation of particularly meaningful relationships as educators, leaders, or friends, uh, those can have huge consequences, both in the sense of ripple effects, also in the sense of making life more worth living in the larger human sphere and not just the life of the mind for the people involved. And, and of course, that might be even more paradigmatically um, action than, than things we might normally associate with politics. So the kind of in principle question about, uh, about not shying away from the world and what it brings doesn't necessarily have the scale that we normally associate with the great political issues of the age or something like that. Um, now Montaigne seemed to want to, um, where he could influence things well, but the common interpretation of him is that he tried to be very careful. Um, and, uh, and flexible, uh, and that he did not want to be, um, at the front, uh, of a battle. Um, and, and I read him that way. My, my, myself, I think, of course, the writings that he did and the impact that they have, that turn that turns out to be more politically efficacious, uh, perhaps anything that he could have done in his lifetime. You see a similar dynamic there. And of course, very clearly in Machiavelli's thinking. Um, but, uh, but your last question, how and when does the liberal artist decide to address the thought policing and extremism in their political milieu? I mean, one way to hear that is you can, you, you can sort of decide that the terms of debate or something like that out there are flawed, unworthy, dangerous, whatever one might, might say, Im immovable, intractable. And therefore, you know, we're going to stay in here and do our thing. And maybe your question is coming from a place of, yeah, but at some point what's out there comes in and then there's a duty, not necessarily the same as arguing that we, you know, we should always be Odyssean versus, you know, living the life of the mind. Um, but that the very thing we want to protect requires a certain kind of engagement. And, and I'm, I myself believe that's always the case in principle, right? Again, there's no switch that any regime can ever flick that says, okay, colleges get to set up on these swaths of green and do whatever they want. And the things that we decide in our rotundas, you know, will never come in and in, 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 uh, encroach on what you do there. That world doesn't exist. In that sense, colleges and universities, just to take the institutions, to the degree to which they, they really are trying to keep open radical investigation and the, and the pursuit of truth for its own sake, and if the truth turns out to be anathema, we're still gonna you know, try to have space to do that. You're always engaged in the same enterprise that Socrates was engaged in. Now, I think a lot can be said about how liberal democracy maybe stakes a claim to a certain kind of harmony with a certain understanding of what liberal education exists for that ends up creating space for freer inquiry and less constraint than than any other regime. I happen to believe that my, 
my myself, and I think that's part of what makes liberal democracy worth fighting for, and also makes uh, defending uh, liberal education in terms that are intelligible uh, to to the regime, to politics, to political culture, to the society, a worthy duty because we have an opportunity uh, that not all regimes even present. Um, there's not enough compromise, you know, that you can do to have a college uh, where anything like inquiry can happen into ultimate things in, in some regimes, of course, right now, um, many uh, on, on this earth. Um, so that's a very positive thing to be embraced, understanding it's always rhetorical, it always involves compromise, and it's always fragile in both directions, so to speak. Um, but there's another angle on that, which is the real issue for liberal education is not, now you might not be saying this, but let's say Tocqueville says this clearly, and it's very powerful. The issue is not that the police are going to come and lock you up for anything that you're going to say in seminar. It's that the pressure to conform with social norms is so great that we censor ourselves. Um, uh, and you know, very powerful literature has, has been written on that and Tocqueville's presentation of that's powerful. That's one of the you know, deep issues with the cave and um, it's one version, one version of what could be meant by the cave beneath the cave. Um, it can lead to the paradoxical idea that, that more obviously oppressive regimes might actually um, and I know you understand this argument and I have colleagues who can make it better than I could, but that actually oppressive regimes, uh, because of the clarity of the injustice of the oppression and the irrationality of it, actually foster in inevitably hidden, right, and, and self-disguising, but more robust and vigorous um, uh, pursuits of intellectual freedom and that it might be the democratic regime where there is no, right, no shackle is going to come, but the kind of psychological weight that Tocqueville describes, and Nietzsche describes it another way, is so powerful, right, is so powerful. And, and you, could, you could go so far as to say so insidious, it's so internalized that it's hard to even find your adversary. And that's, and that's a different set of issues. And maybe there's a kind of, again, to use your language, kind of engagement, addressing the thought policing, a kind of standing up that brings that issue into the open that's part of pr protecting uh, it. I don't know. I think I'm going to I'm gonna have to leave it there because um, I think my my response to your final question, when does the liberal artist decide to address the thought policing? Always, I think, because, but that's always rhetorical. It's not necessarily a matter of opposition. It's, it's always a matter of protecting in whatever way is necessary, the space for the life of the mind. But what that thought policing looks like can, can be so different and varied, and you could mean different things by it that, that you know, the answer is going to, the answer is going to vary. I'm, um, I think I'm gonna take a couple more questions and maybe about 7.30 um, uh, wrap, wrap up. Um, I'm gonna go over here for a second. Let's see, I'm, I'm looking at a couple questions where I think I've maybe said what I have to say on them. Okay, uh, Alejandro Ross, I found much of this lecture in its summary of Montaigne's ideas beautiful and poignant, but I just got finished reading Deuteronomy, which seemed an attempt to attack or cure this tendency, possibility, freedom, freedom maybe in quotes, of each person to do what is right in their eyes, implying some problem with this state of affairs. How do you and or Montaigne see or confront the potential problems of this freedom or maybe why is this freedom better? 
so so taken as an ultimate and absolute position uh i'm i'm myself doubt that it's the the best or the highest it's not it's not where i finally push my chips out so what i'm saying in the lecture is first of all it's hard to know where montaigne pushed <laughs> pushes his chips out because of the character of his writing and thought, right? I mean, I only, I allude to this in a backhanded way by saying, you know, uh, humanist par excellence, most, but not all would say secular humanist. There's a way of reading Montaigne as a believer, extreme minority opinion, I think. Um, maybe that's an exaggeration to say extreme, minor, but in any event, the minority opinion, but the idea is that skepticism clears the field and makes possible a kind of simple uh, faith that doesn't have to be rational. And he carries that lightly, let, let's say. Um, I don't know that the author of Deuteronomy is going gonna, is gonna to view Montaigne as exemplifying uh, what's at stake there. So in any event, Montaigne himself is complicated. But what I was trying to say is, you know, different different philosophers, there's their ultimate position, and then there are aspects of their thought that seem to have teeth at, at certain moments, certain times. And I think even if one doesn't go on the whole journey with Montaigne, that um, I think the author of Deuteronomy would be concerned about the forms of auto, uh, automation that, I've, that I was talking about and could see um, could see uh, in Montaigne some ground clearing that can then make possible another kind of relationship to to the divine. But I'm I'm sort of saying that I'm not treating Montaigne. I'm not taking up his position in that contest of ideas. I'm more interested in what it looks like if you start from the premise that it's so hard to get past. Um, the the voices that are already in our head and models of education that seem to want to clone or replicate or commodify uh knowledge uh and to try to break out of that and have some ownership of one's own judgment i think many religious believers would want would want that active wakeful aspect of montaigne's thought to be a part of their of their own uh, religious belief. But but you're raising the question that I raised at the end. I mean, one way to put it, a, a later idiom is autonomy versus heteronomy. And, uh, you know, Montaigne seems to be a thinker of autonomy, maybe the er thinker of modern autonomy. I, my own perception of certainly what we might call traditional religious orthodoxy of all the Abrahamic faiths is that there's a deep uh, heteronomy there, that o obedience and love for and from, right, a being that's fundamentally asymmetrical uh, uh, to you is decisive, that that's, uh, un that's the ground uh, of our being. You know, I mean, you can start to, I mean, Montaigne's such a playful thinker if he's, he said, well, eh, maybe. Yeah, I've, I've read those books too. And I don't, you know, I mean, that's kind of where, where he is. He knows all those claims are out there. He can't find any of them, in any of them, I think, compelling on their own terms. Um, okay, I'm, I'm going to stop there. Uh, Mr. Cornell asked a, a follow-up, and I'm, I'm going to take it here. I guess I'm asking, are there particular moments, for example, when free speech and respect for Western classics are under fierce public attack to make it irresponsible for liberal artists to remain silent? Wouldn't that, in effect, contribute to the extremism that silences every, every moderate voice? And I mean, in a lot of these debates, we, we have the, the sort of silence is complicity um, uh, argument. I guess I find the, the terms of the question a little bit too, too binary, because again, I would agree right at the outset that um, 
that, uh, I mean, just look at our program, right? We, we can't be doing what we do if we don't think there's tremendous value uh, for everyone in reading authors like Plato and Aristotle, Descartes, Kant, Hegel. And I think we're always having to defend that against some kind of challenges and, and charges. So I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not oblivious to the kinds of debates that are out there I, I, I don't see them as, as new. Um, I don't know. I guess I have to, I guess I have to, to leave it there. I, I, you know, I, I mean, I think there are, are folks who, who, you know, if they're, they're in their Epicurean garden and um, that's good enough for them. I, I don't think in those in those terms, I mean, I think educators, so to speak, can't. You've you've got to be able to defend and have a will to you know to defend the the premises and and continued existence of the conditions that make the kind of education that you think is most important uh, possible. So, uh, I, you know, I, I I guess that's I, I guess that's my agreeing with you. I'm sorry, we do have other good questions here. I'm, I'm, I'm missing a couple to you. You know, there are several good questions here, and and I think they're highlighting for me that I might have that I might have hit the wall a little bit because they 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 seem quite challenging. So I just want to acknowledge those of you who who uh, who uh, offered the, these questions. They're very good, and feel free to email me the question. I'll come back to you. And anybody whose question I didn't get to, feel free to email me, and I'll come back to you. They're they're just a few. They're all so good, but I sort of have set this time as my outer as my outer limits so i just want to thank thank you all quite a few of you, know, if you have stayed stayed on I'm, I'm very happy for the engagement we had in the question period for your patience for the long lecture um and uh, you know i take heart apropos of mr cornell's uh challenging questions uh i take heart when i see the attendance at events like this and people who are taking the time with all the pressures that we're under uh, to engage in these kinds of conversations and inquiries about some of the most uh, important things. And I'm grateful for your doing that. And, uh, and I hope we'll see many of you at the events we have in the coming weeks. So thank you all.